is here's where I usually tell a story. It was a very interesting, instructive story. There was this uh, businessman in India who had problems like businessmen do. And uh, what they do in India is they go to a Swami. Uh, <laughs> and the Swami usually lives in the Himalayas. And the higher in the Himalayas, the wiser he's supposed to be. You live, uh, higher you live, uh, the more uh, wisdom you're supposed to have. Uh, and it gets colder and you're supposed to wear less and less clothes as you go up there. And that's a really great Swami. So this uh, businessman, he, this, um, th this chap, he goes up to a pretty uh, a great Swami who lives very high up in the Himalayas. And he says to the Swami, um, Oh Swami, I am miserable. I am miserable. Help me. Swami says, are you, do you experience your misery? Do you feel your misery? He says, of course I do. That's why I've come to you. Then he says, if you feel your misery, if you feel your misery, if you know your misery, then you cannot be miser miserable. You are the knower of the misery in your mind. Because the knower and the known are different. Misery is a feeling in your mind. If you are aware of it, you are that which is aware of the feeling in the mind, aware of the misery in the mind. That which is aware of fear is not fearful. That which is aware of sadness is not sad. Now, this person thought about it. And if you think about it, you know, if you, if you do that, the result will be, at the very least, the problems in the mind will become a little quieter. The moment you put some psychological space between the problems in your mind and yourself, the man thought like this, mind calm down a little, as it will. You can try it. And he came back to the Swami. And, this, um, and he said, Swami, you are right. That's really profound, Swami. I am very peaceful now. And the real fun starts now. Uh, the teaching, is, that was not the teaching, the teaching comes now. And the Swami immediately says to him sharply, No, you are not peaceful. You are the knower of the peace in your mind. <laughs> you see how profound that is. The moment I say there is misery in my mind and I get attached to it, and the Swami teaches me that which I'm aware of is different from me, so I'm aware of the misery in my mind, so I am different from the misery in my mind, and the misery sort of diminishes, sort of becomes controllable, igno you can ignore it, and mind feels peaceful. The moment I say I am peaceful, I'm again attached to the mind. What will happen is this chap, when he goes down from the Himalayas into Delhi or whatever, uh, whatever else, you know, like, like you go away from here into 101, the peace disappears again. That's the nature of the mind. If you're attached to the peace in your mind, the moment the mind loses its peace, is you say, oh, in the Vedanta society or in the Himalayas, I was so peaceful. Now I have lost the peace in the mind. You are a knower of the peace in your mind. You are the knower of the lack of peace in your mind. You are the knower of the happiness in your mind. You are the knower of the misery in your mind. You are different from the happiness. You are, you are apart from the misery. You are, you are the observer, quite different from the peace in your mind. In fact, thus being different from the peace or the lack of peace in your mind, that is true peace. In the Upanishads, Mandukya Upanishad, one of the names for the Atman, the self, one of your names is peace. Shantam Shivam. The name of the Atman is peace. It's not that the Atman, that the, the, the spiritual self is peaceful. It is peace itself. Whether the mind is at peace, whether the body is at peace, whether the world is at peace, you are eternally undisturbed. That peace, that is the witness. That is what you are. Even when you clutch the mind to yourself, this is my mind. The misery of the mind is my mind. The ignorance of the mind is my mind. The unspiritual nature, the worldly nature of the mind is my mind. Even then, we are telling ourselves something that is false. We are attached, so strongly attached to the mind and through the mind to the world. I often give this very stark example you find in the, um, in the Vedanta among the Swamis in the Himalayas. Think of the greatest possible attachment 
in the world. The greatest possible attachment, human attachment in the world, is the attachment of a mother for her baby. The greatest possible attachment. And it's a good attachment. The baby needs it. But it's the greatest possible. It's extremely strong. Whatever the mother does, somewhere at the back of the mind will be an awareness of, of what the child is doing and how the child is. Now imagine that mother, when the baby goes to sleep and the, finally the mother goes to sleep, I can see some lady smiling. Swami, you don't know anything about babies. <laughs> Mothers do not go get much sleep. <laughs> yes, but when the mother finally get, goes to sleep, that mother, so tremendously attached to the baby, would not like to be separated from the baby for more than a little bit of time. That mother happily, completely, totally forgets the baby. Not unwillingly willingly goes into deep sleep, complete forgetfulness of the world, of the baby, of her own body, everything forgotten. And it does, the mother does that every night and does it willingly and happily. It's a, it's a common experience. We never reflect upon it philosophically, what it means philosophically. So whatever is there in the mind, you are the witness of that mind and the witness is ever separate from the mind. The very fact that you are the knower of the mind means you are not the mind. Not yet Vedanta, very far from it. But already, just about every problem in the world is solved. What a strange statement, Swami. Think about it. Problems are in the world, or in our bodies, or in our minds. If you are separate from the mind, you are an entity, you are independent of the mind and the body. The problems of the mind and the body do not touch you. You may be aware of them. When they come up, you are aware of them. When they go away, you are aware that the problems have gone. But they are not your problems. They never were, they never will be. You are free to clutch, hold on to them. My misery, my poverty, my failure, my desires. You are free to hold on to them, but they do not belong to you. You have to learn to let go of what you actually you cannot hold on to. It will go away anyway. It has come. You imagine that you're hold, holding on to it. It will go away. However hard you hold on to your worst problem, it goes away. It goes away every night. Just think about it. The pro guy with the worst kind of problems in the, uh, in the intensive care unit of the, of the, what's the hospital, Cedar sinai in the intensive care unit of that hospital, of uh, dying, multiple diseases, organ failure, no hope. The moment that guy goes into sleep, into deep sleep, that guy's deep sleep, and the billionaire's deep sleep, and Obama's deep sleep, the president, most powerful uh, president, most powerful country in the world, their deep sleep is exactly the same. No problems. All right. Now, you know, learning to let go. I can't help but tell you that little story here. It's, it's another of the Swamis, other stories the Swamis in the Himalayas tell. What is this learning to let go? There was this monkey, a farmer, who is to keep uh, bananas in a jar. And the jar had a narrow neck. And there was a monkey who watched this. And when the farmer would go a little distance away, the monkey would come down from the tree and put its hand in the, uh, in the jar and take out the bananas and run away. And the farmer thought, how, how do I get, you know, control this pest? So what he did, he got a jar with a much more nar a narrower neck. And he put it there and he forced the bananas inside one by one. The monkey watched all this. When the farmer went a little distance, the monkey climbed down put its hand in, you can imagine the triumphant grin, and caught hold of the banana. But the problem is now, it can't pull the banana out of the jar. Because the, the neck is not wide enough for the banana and its hand. And the farmer comes and trashes the poor little monkey, you know, gives him a solid beating. Now how can the poor little monkey, that's not very poor, a pretty naughty monkey, how can the monkey, monkey escape the thrashing? The only way the monkey can escape is to let go of the banana. But the monkey doesn't occur to it. So attached to the banana, tremendously, I will not let go. 
and it takes a beating. You can just let go and it can run away, but it will not let go. It is not trapped. The only thing that traps it, it's desire and it's confusion that I cannot take my hand out. You cannot take your hand out because you're holding on to something which is not part of your hand. It's how does the monkey escape? By letting go of the banana. Letting go of the banana, the monkey becomes a monk. <laughs> you let go of what never belonged to you anyway. What does not belong to you? That which belongs to the world. That which belongs to the body. <coughs> that which is part of the mind. None of this belongs to you. You are the witness. Thank <laughs> you.